So uh, welcome everyone to the second session um, to dive deeper into the, the principles for local led adaptation. So this session is around really trying to deepen understanding with the CBA community and get your insight to how we see them delivering real impact and how we will help them deliver real impact. Before we get going and while we wait for Aisha to rejoin, just to take a few, a few of the more boring side of the event. So obviously I know you're all super probably uh, familiar with the Zoom, uh, Zoom etiquette, but I have to just take you quickly through this for some who may not be as familiar. So just to say we're recording the meeting and we may make some parts of this call um, available on our website at a later date, so please do let us know if that's going to be an issue. Um, we've obviously taken the security precautions to prevent uninvited participants from joining and Zoom bombing, but if you do notice any such content, um, please do let us know in the chat function. Uh, we have uh, myself and Aisha, Aisha just back, um, who are co-hosting sessions to let one of us know. And we have my colleague Larissa in doing the tech wizardry in the background. Um, so you can also let her know if there's any issues, but also any challenges you're having engaging in the session. And please don't share the Zoom link uh, on social media, especially to prevent any unwanted participants. And we do recommend that you do shut down any other uh, platforms that you're using, such as Skype and Teams, to maximise your uh, ability to engage in the session. And just a few of the uh, just the ways to engage in the session, you will be muted. And when we go into the breakout sessions, which there are two today, you will be able to unmute. Please do put your video on if you have the bandwidth. It's always great to see people's faces and try and mimic an in-person event as much as we can. Um, and you will be able to see uh, all the participants who are on this call. I think I just said at the beginning, do try and rename yourself so you can um, so we can see which organization you're from. You can just go and three dots next to you if you right click on your, your face that is coming up on the screen and you can add your organizational title. And there you can also raise hand um, and do some um, issues to kind of draw attention to other facilitators. Um, that's just the information on how to update your name. So I'll skip over that, Aish has already introduced that. Um, and also there's a chat function. We do really promote you to get engaged on the chat, whether it's responding to some of the panelists starting some conversations on some of the issues we talk about in this session um, and also just getting to know each other and um, do introduce yourself on the chat where you're from and where you're based that's great to see um, and um, also you can react to things that are said you can use the reaction buttons to I guess give a thumbs up if you agree give a clap if you really liked an intervention so just getting to started on the session I just want to check if our other co-host, Aisha, has been able to rejoin or if I should keep cracking on. I'm here, Mark. I'm so sorry. Great. No problem. Internet side. No problem at all. Um, I will hand back over to Aisha then to take you through what the session's all about and then to hand over to Saranjana after that. Over to you, Aisha. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Actually, Larissa, I do need you to please um, allow me to share my screen. Uh, Larissa, when possible, if you can let me share my screen. Um, okay, well, Mark, I wonder if you have yeah, the slides up. I'll do it, no problem. Thank you so much. Okay, so, so sorry for that technical difficulty. Um, let's dive into the session. So, um, the principles for locally led adaptation were developed uh, through many years of work by several institutions and they were launched um, under the Global Commission of, uh, for Adaptation on Adaptation in January 2021. And the Global Commission on Adaptation housed a locally led adaptation work stream, which was steered by two commissioners who are with us today, Sheila Patel from SDI and Dr. Mohamed Musa from BRAC International. And several organizations have played really integral roles in developing and moving ahead with the principles, including, of course, IAD, ICAD, Highway Commission, and others. So to say this, essentially, the principles were developed in a very collaborative and consultative manner. Um, and now we have 50 organizations that have endorsed the principles. Mark, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, and many of these organizations that have endorsed have been joining the CBA sessions yesterday and today, and we'll hear from some of them in just a minute. Um, but before we go into the session um, where we're gonna have Saranjana interview some of these endorsing organizations, I wanted to take a minute to just 
give an overview of what the principles are to refresh those who are familiar with them or um, help those unfamiliar to, to understand what we're talking about. Um, so I'm going to go to the next slide. Uh, yes. So there are eight principles for locally led adaptation. And the first one is devolving decision making to the lowest appropriate level. So what we're talking about here is, is really giving local institutions and communities more direct access to finance and decision making power on how adaptation actions are defined, what's prioritized, how they're designed, implemented, and monitored. The second principle is addressing structural inequalities faced by women, youth, children, disabled, displaced, and indigenous people, as well as marginalized ethnic groups. So the idea behind this principle is to really integrate the different forms of inequality that are in fact the root cause of vulnerability um, into adaptation actions and really encouraging vulnerable and otherwise marginalized communities or individuals to really meaningfully participate in and lead adaptation decisions. Um, the third principle is providing patient and predictable funding that can be accessed more easily. So supporting long-term development of local governance processes, capacity and institutions um, to really be able to access uh, finance as well as providing longer term and more predictable finance to um, ensure that communities can effectively implement adaptation. Uh, number four is investing in local capabilities to leave an institutional legacy. So what we're talking about here is really improving the capabilities of local institutions to ensure that they understand what kind of risks are, they understand the uncertainty within them, and they um, have what they need in order to generate solutions and manage adaptation interventions without really being um, overly dependent on project-based uh, donor funding. Uh, principle five is building a robust understanding of climate risk and uncertainty. So that's, you know, informing adaptation decisions um, through a combination of both local traditional indigenous knowledge as well as scientific knowledge. Uh, principle six on flexible programming and learning is really about enabling adaptive management to address sort of the inherent uncertainty that's in adaptation. Um, and that can happen through kind of, you know, robust monitoring systems, learning systems, flexible finance and programming. Um, so you can see here how some of the principles are linked together. Uh, principle seven is ensuring transparency and accountability. And um, we really do try and um, encourage a downward accountability to local stakeholders. Um, and finally, principle eight is collaborative action and investment. Uh, so, you know, we have different um, sectors, different initiatives, different levels of government all in involved here. Um, and we have, you know, uh, the humanitarian assistance, uh, disaster risk reduction, green recovery of funds. So really ensuring there's alignment and support um, and complementarity between all of the action on locally land. Um, so that's kind of a, a, a snapshot of what the principles are. Um, Mark, could you go to the next slide, please? Yes. Um, so all the organizations that have actually endorsed the principles have agreed to be part of a 10-year learning journey, uh, which includes specific events throughout the year. So we have Gobeshna at the start of the year, CBA, uh, where we're at now at the middle of the year, and then COP at the end of the year. Um, and we're, of course, early on in this learning journey, but we've been seeing some really fantastic momentum, uh, both by the endorsing organizations as well as kind of political support for the principles. Um, next slide, please. So very quickly, what we're going to do today is um, the goals of the session are really to increase CBAs, the community's engagement around these eight principles, um, to deepen understanding of what good practice could look like, um, and to unpack what implementation um, might look like on the ground and what the challenges are. So trying to be quite concrete. Uh, not about kind of what we hope to do or want to do, but more what uh, where the rubber hits the road. Um, and the way we're going to do this is we're going to have Saranjana Gupta um, from the Hyrule Commission um, do interviews with endorsing organizations. So she'll do interviews for principles five and six, and then we'll have breakouts for groups uh, for principles five and six. And then we'll come back to plenary and she'll do um, interviews for principles seven and eight, and then we'll have breakouts um, for group seven and eight, and then close the session. So uh, next one. 
um, we have a great uh, set of endorsers here to join our panel. For principle five, we're going to have uh, Melody Braun from the International Research Institute for Climate and Society. For principle six, we have Heather McGray from the Climate Justice Resilience Fund. For principle seven, we have Neve Fallon from Irish Aid. And then for principle eight, we have Sheila Patel from SCMA. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask Saranjana to um, please stick over and begin the final interviews. Um, and then after that, we'll move out into the breakout groups. Um, but before, uh, yeah, I think that's it. Can I please? Yeah, okay. That's perfect. Okay, so Saranjana, over to you. Thank you, Aisha. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all are enjoying the community-based adaptation conference. And I hope that yesterday's session on the locally led principles for adaptation gave you some serious food for thought. Um, today, I have the privilege of interviewing four very interesting and different uh, people who come from very different kinds of institutions, scientific, uh, government, uh, civil society institutions to find out from them how they interpret principles five, six, seven, and eight that focus on understanding climate risk, flexible programming, transparency and accountability, and collaborative action. How do they interpret these principles? What do they need to do to get these principles to really work for them, to work for local people, local communities, local government in some cases on the ground? And what challenges do they foresee in actually getting the principles to deliver impact on climate adaptation? So with that, let me call my first guest, Melody Braun. Hi, Melody. Hi, Shandana. Hi. 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 So you're from the International Research Institute on Climate and Society that sits in the Earth Institute at Columbia. And you are going to help us understand how your institution that endorsed this, these principles is planning to help local people build a more robust understanding of climate risk and uncertainty. So tell me how you're, from sitting where you are, how are you interpreting this principle and how local is local when it comes to getting information on climate risk? Thanks. Thanks, Ranjana. I think that question is the key, right? How local is local? So first, I think for the context of this principle, um, there's a gap between the people that are generating climate information and the people who need it to adapt. And the result of that is that we have a lot of scientific information available uh, that could potentially help prevent crop losses, infrastructure damage, loss of lives. Um, but that often isn't used uh, by communities or by practitioners because it's too technical. And that's because it's often developed in a silo without interaction with users. So the whole point of, um, to, to me, to us at IRI, the whole point of building a, a, a robust understanding of climate risk and climate uncertainty is to try to address that gap. And to do that, the first thing to do, the very first thing to do is to um, establish platforms, communication channels, or any any type of space really that allows communities, community practitioners, researchers and scientists to exchange and share information. And so what kind of information would that be? <laughs> On the community side, um, basically communities have been facing climate impacts as we know for you know, many, many years. And so they have a whole range of information, um, a whole range of, of knowledge, local knowledge, traditional knowledge, on, um, on climate impacts and how they respond to it. And, and so we need to understand that. So for example, what are the local impacts that they're facing? How do they respond to it and why? Uh, what are their current practices? What are their current channels of information and communication? Um, what are their current barriers um, to access additional information? And mostly, what are decisions or activities or strategies that they could do differently if they had access to different information or additional information? And so once we have a good understanding of that, 
then the scientists and the researchers can provide knowledge on the scientific data, climate data that is available that can further inform decisions. And so at IRI, we have a team of climate scientists, a team of sectoral scientists, and we work with partners on generating and translating climate information. And so some of the things that in our experience is usually useful for people to understand are things like understanding the difference between long-term climate change trends that look at a very distant future, but that we talk a lot about and uh, shorter, like increased climate variability, which is more about what's going to happen today, tomorrow in the coming season. And this is important because we talk about climate change and it's obviously critical to talk about climate change, but most decisions that people make um, are, are more in the short term. And so there is information about the short term that, that people need to understand and access. And if, for example, if a, if a region becomes drier because of climate change, it could still have a very wet season and people will still need to adapt to the fact that that se particular season will be very wet. So there is information about that. Another thing is understanding the type of decisions that the type of information that can be helpful. For example, everyone always thinks about forecasts and information about the future but forecasts are not always available. And in many cases, just having good data, good information about the past and the present and knowing how to use it can really actually help uh, make decisions and, and understand what is likely to happen. Um, also understanding uncertainty and, and how much can we trust climate information? Where should it get it from? Those are things that are um, generally useful that scientists can help bring um, in the conversation with communities. And then also just, I think it's important to state that we can't turn everyone into a, a climate expert or a climate scientist. And so it's also just important to know who to ask and who are the resource people in your country and in your community. So to me, that's the step one, but there's a step two that I think is not necessarily included in the principle or, or I guess not, not phrased, which is, once people have a robust understanding of climate risk and climate uncertainty and when the scientists understand the context the local context and the communities understand the scientific information um, there's a, an additional step that is co-production of climate products that are then tailored to the local context tailored to the needs of the community and that requires equitable interdisciplinary partnerships where communities are brought in and, and fully part of the discussion from the very beginning, all the way up to until the evaluation of the of the products. Wow. Yeah. So I got two or three points uh, from that. One is this idea that there are decisions to be made in the short term, but even though climate uh, climate change is a, is basically a long term trend, and then you're talking about different kinds of information, past and present, that can help us. But the climate products is really the information services which are tailored to people's needs and are applicable, right? So we're kind of a long way from there at present, is what you're saying. So yeah. where? Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So I was going to ask you, where do you see, uh, where do you foresee the biggest challenge in moving forward in, in trying to accomplish all this and support local communities to, to arrive at the right place where they have the right service that helps them apply the data in the way that they need to? Yeah, I think um, whether it's a long way or not, I think really depends on the country. Some countries have already done a lot in, in that sense, but really, yeah, you have the information, which is for example, communities accessing um, a forecast and being able to understand it, or that would be just, you know, having a good understanding of, of a, a type of climate information, but there could also be a specific advisory that's given to farmers that says, well, in agriculture, this is what you should do because this is what's going to happen with the climate. So it's like one step of translation further. So in terms of challenges, I think the main one is that it takes a village. <laughs> um, the, the meteorological services are like the part of the government that is mandated to produce climate information and they have to be part of the conversation. And I think that's the first thing where often now that we have access to so much information online 
um, and you know we're trying to involve the private sector like there's so much information that's out there that people don't necessarily know who to ask and where to go and I would say the metro the national meteorological services should always be part of the conversation because they always have the most local information so even if there's private sector saying that they have the best information it's great mm -hmm. to talk to them but it should also include um the the, the national um meteorological agencies i think um okay. another thing is sorry i don't sorry i have to cut you off because we don't have any more time but thank you for your very insightful remarks on an area that i think many of us are grappling to figure out what to do around so thank you for that and let me move to the next guest who is heather mcgray of the climate justice resilience fund hi heather good morning good morning hi saranjana good evening hi. i should say uh, so Heather, the Climate Justice Resilience Fund has been supporting and thinking about new ways to do more around flexible programming and learning. And who's that learning focused on? And give us a sense, a little bit of a sense of your flexible programming as well. Sure. Um, thanks so much. Um, uh, and good morning, everyone. Um, the Climate Justice Resilience Fund is a philanthropic initiative that um, makes grants to support women and youth and indigenous peoples in um, building and sharing their own solutions for, um, for climate resilience. Uh, we work pretty bottom up, or at least we try to, um, supporting work that's really grounded in, in locally led action. And we're, um, we're a little bit of a different funder. We pool funding from three different foundations uh, at the moment and um, make grants that average out to about $5 million every year. Um, there's really two things when it comes to learning and flexibility I thought I'd share. I mean, really, mostly I'll talk about our own learning and flexibility that we've tried to bake into our own programming, but then also a support for learning um, that we provide as a funder and how we approach that I thought might also be worth um, um, sharing a little bit about. Um, and in terms of flexible programming, we've had a real education in this over the last year because of COVID. And there's a few things that we've instituted in order to be able to better support our partners um, um, for example, many of them have had delays in their work and they've needed to adjust their grant agreements with us. They've need, needed to adjust strategies and, and activities and timelines in particular. And um, we've done everything we can to make adjustments in grants and um, extensions of timelines as, as speedy and as flexible as possible. Uh, and we found that Really, most of, of our grantee partners have, have needed some extra time on their work. Um, and that is fortunately um, the way that we're set up. That's been pretty easy um, for us to do. Many grants have gone from two years to three years or you know, two years to two and a half years um, in terms of their expected time frame. We've also been able to make budgets and reporting more flexible for people. And um, this has been a little bit of an experiment. Um, we're still not sure, you know, it's still pretty early in terms of our reporting cycles, in terms of um, whether that flexibility is working for our partners or not. But some of them in particular, um, when um, COVID really upended strategies, um, really needed to be able to pivot. And um, we've tried as much as we can to, to flex with them on that. Um, one of the challenges for us is of course, I, you know, I run the program for the Climate Justice Resilience Fund, but there are some limits um, in terms of the administrative side and um, budget and reporting requirement flexibility. And I have, done what I can to adjust those, but there are um, lawyers and, and accountants and, and people for whom there's real, really some limits to flexibility. Um, so one of the things we've discovered, for example, is that our, for our local locally led organizations, our, our budget template actually can be really, really quite confusing. And so we have 
initiated a different approach to development of budgets um, under our uh, grant making, where I work with our partners to develop a budget that they understand that's very simple, that's usually just four or five lines. Um, but our, our accounting team really does want to see that in a particular format um, that's a little bit more elaborate and that's it's pretty challenging for some organizations. Um, so we we actually have done that um, that translation to the accounting team's budget internally, rather than requiring our partners to do that, uh, and um, that seems to be working. Um, on the learning side, one minute. Um, yeah, this. Um, um, there's kind of structural and cultural elements to learning, I find. And, and we have set up some structures in terms of a council of advisors that's um, specifically intended for to help us with learning. On the cultural side, it's, it's really a practice that has to be developed as a, as a funder and as a, a supporter of grants. Um, we actually have set up a small grants program, and, and this has helped with COVID flexibility as well, that, um, that's um, really designed to um, respond to opportunities and to specifically support partners in their learning. We also do things like sponsor this conference, the, the Community-Based Adaptation Conference. Uh, and uh, I recommend to all of you the catalytic grant program that ECAD is, is running. Um, CGRF and GRP have teamed up to support that as a learning investment and a learning investment that's you know, intended to be quite dynamic and um, to be one of the threads along that 10-year learning journey that Aisha described earlier. Um, so I'll stop there. There's plenty more yeah. I could say, um, but thank you, Saranjana. Thank you. I hope you get a chance to say more in the in the groups. But I think in addition to the flexibility around you know simplifying budgeting and the handholding, the idea of creating an institutional culture around reflecting and learning and analyzing really stood out to me. So uh, let me stop there and hand back to Aisha, who's going to send you off into your breakout groups to discuss further. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, um, Saranjana and Melody and Hader. Those were all really, really in insightful and thoughtful remarks that should set us up really well for the breakout groups. Um, so for the breakout discussions, um, what we're gonna do is really talk through two questions. One is um, focusing on implementation. So what does implementation of this principle mean in practice for an endorsing organization? Um, and the second question is, what are the challenges to actually um, implementing this principle in practice? Um, so we'll have hopefully about 20 or 22 minutes um, per breakout. And what we wanna do in the breakouts is use something called Jamboard. Um, so this is essentially a virtual whiteboard or um, a wall where you can kind of put sticky notes. Um, and if you look on the on the left of the screen, there's a bar with this little image, which is supposed to be the sticky note. And you can write, uh, you know, whatever your intervention is anonymously or add your name at the bottom. And um, on top, you'll see these little arrows that toggle through the different um, boards, as it were, one per question. Um, but just to say, if you're having trouble with the Jamboard, please don't worry. Just, just leave it be. We can um, just use the Zoom, you know, verbal and chat functions. Um, so your facilitators will put the Jamboard link into the chat. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't, don't worry about it. Um, we're going to have two breakout groups per principal. So for principal five, group A will be with Marek and B will be with Isia. And for principal six, Group A will be with Tamara and B will be with Saki. And we want you to, of course, choose which principle you want to discuss. So in just a minute, Larissa will um, change the screen and you'll, you'll be able to see um, these options. And so please choose whichever principle, but the, the point of the two groups is that we have as much of an even split as possible. So please choose the group that has fewer participants so that we end up with kind of even groups. Um, and then just very quickly, uh, sorry, if you are having a problem with the breakout groups, there's this little ask for help button and that'll invite you, uh, to, I'll give you this option to invite host, or you can just message Larissa um, and we can help you get into the breakout group. Um, and then the breakout group, you'll have a little warning when we're ending the time. So Larissa, I think 
that's it. And if you can help us move into those groups, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, I think we have almost everyone. So um, welcome back. I hope you had really great conversations in the breakout groups. I flitted between them and the conversation did sound really rich. So um, what we're gonna do instead of reporting back is something called a chat shower. So I'm gonna give you about half a minute and ask you to think about what the top takeaway was from your discussion and type it into the chat box, um, but don't hit send until I do a countdown and, and say go. And then at that moment, we'll be able to see everyone's top takeaways at the same time. So go ahead and start thinking about, you know, what it was that struck you the most or uh, a take home message that you're, you're taking away from that conversation and, and type it into the chat. And um, I'll do the countdown in, in just a, about 20 seconds. Okay. Um, well, hopefully some folks have put some thoughts in there. So I'm going to do a countdown and then you can hit send. Um, all right. Three, two, one, go. Oh, wow. You're coming in so fast. I can barely keep up. All right. I'm just going to call some out. Focusing on monitoring the process rather than just the output um, can really help with supporting flexibility and learning. Um, a question about who are the intermediaries, in fact. Um, our willingness to be more flexible and adjust planning um, from both the donor all the way to the community. Um, it really comes down to trust and willingness and humility to make mistakes on all sides. Um, an equitably funded partnership over time uh, to develop collaboration between different stakeholders. So there's some really great um, really great things that are in the chat. So I'd encourage everyone to take a look, um, but we'll also be circulating this after. So thank you, everybody. Um, I'm gonna turn back now to Saranjana, who's gonna um, do the, the second two interviews with the endorsing organization. Um, so back to Saranjana, thank you. Thanks, Aisha. So I hope all of you had a very interesting chat. I know our discussion in uh, one of the groups that talked about climate information was pretty interesting and even got mildly heated. So who would imagine a discussion of climate information could get slightly heated? That was quite exciting. Okay, um, I'm uh, very pleased to invite a representative of Irish Aid, Nee Fallon, to join me as my next guest. Hello, Neve. can we hear you? Hi there, hi, Saranjana. Hi. All right, so now that we have you online, um, tell me how you as Irish Aid, you're a bilateral donor, you collect taxpayer money, how do, are you interpreting the principle on locally led adaptation? Um, well, I suppose the chapter... sorry, on transparency, on transparency and accountability. Sorry. Sure. Yeah, I suppose the challenge for us is, is viewing transparency and accountability through this business unusual lens. And obviously the crux of that is that downward accountability and, and transparency concept. So in terms of interpreting the principle and, and reflecting on it for ourselves, there are kind of two layers. I think um, the first is that question of, of communication and accessibility, crucially, and Principle 7 definitely obviously draws attention to the fact that there's not enough attention paid maybe to, to building local understandings of what programs are seeking to achieve. And I think Melody kind of touched on this point in, in a from a, a different perspective, maybe. Um, and we know there are a number of practical barriers, barriers to that, including language. But it's a reminder to us, I suppose, that availability of information and accessibility of information aren't always the same thing. Um, but we fully appreciate that communicating these things more effectively um, it creates a, an enabling environment then for the second layer of, of local decision making. Um, and the overarching principle of our own uh, international development strategy is reaching the furthest behind first. And as part of that, we've, we've recognised that that demands that we engage with the local contexts and the institutions that determine how development happens. 
um, and that we we engage with the local political contexts in which development takes place so that we can design programmes that are appropriate and flexible um, and as best we can. Um, so our outlook is, is to engage across all levels of response from local and subnational to, to national and global, obviously. Um, and our ambition is to kind of reinforce, reinforce good practice and accountability um, in terms of the allocation of resources but through different challenges of delivery, I think is is our is the crucial point. Um, so let me interrupt you there for a minute and ask when you when you say we engage with the local contexts, what, what did you mean, and what did you mean in relation to local led action? So accountability. Yeah. I mean, we have obviously our mission network, uh, which is crucial in this. And I know many, many of our climate focal points are participating in the conference, but also um, just in general, as, as a small donor, our niche has traditionally been community based development responses um, a lot through our, our NGO pro, uh, partners or sorry, CSOs and, um, and our bilateral support. And, and that's been our, our niche in that kind of long term. Uh, partnership in rural communities specifically. So um, our programs are focused on kind of conservation, agriculture, community-based management, um, of acute nutrition, holistic responses um, to gender-based violence. But um, we, we have then accountability mechanisms with these CSO implementing partners. We do have, have a degree of it. I think we've further to go with it. Um, but we do have requirements around demonstrating that community input has fed into program design. Um, and we require that this is illustrated at various points of the process proposal, uh, reporting and, and evaluation as well. Um, but it is it is a, a work in progress, particularly principle seven. Um, so 99% of our, our climate finance currently supports adaptation efforts. Um, and that's essentially 100% grants based. Um, but we're committed to investing heavily in the transparency around that. Um, and one of our explicit priorities obviously is that it reaches the local level, but we could certainly embed that more strongly um, and ongoing process. So give us an example of how you're investing in more transparency and accountability to the local level. We're at, I would say in, in that sort of broad sense, um, of the climate financing, we're at quite an early stage um, in that we, we have an opportunity to you know, reflect these principles in that we're, we're scaling up our climate finance this year, um, or at least developing the methodologies to do so over, over the coming decade. Um, and we're looking to climate proof our ODA as a related um, process. So we'd welcome, I suppose, stronger international coordination on the one hand. I think that would, that would benefit transparency at that broad global level. Um, but then in terms of relevance for locally led adaptation, it would show us where the money is going um, and, you know, how, how that's being tracked um, a little more clearly. So we would welcome um, coordination on that. But in terms of our own reporting structures, you know, we can look to see we've obviously screened for adaptation versus mitigation in our uh, 2019 report. But, um, you know, it, it would be interesting to look to see what steps we can take to to dig a little deeper into that in, in terms of uh, what's going locally. Um, I should also mention as well, just that we participate in, in the Life AOR initiative, um, which is a really valuable learning experience for us. Um, and as most will know, the initiative was established last year um, to enable locally driven climate action in LDCs. So that's a, yeah, it's a, it's a steep learning curve for us, but it's, it's a valuable one as well. Thank you so much, Neve. And what I got out of that is, the steep learning curve as it is, I think that's something that probably re resonates with a lot of organizations, but I hope you're going to pick up some of these points that you made later in the breakout uh, groups where you talked about increasing community input to design and also exploring new ways of reporting out and being transparent about what kind of money is going out and reaching local communities and how international coordination might assist you to do some of that work. Thank you so much. Um, and let's go to our next guest, who is Sheila Patel, surprised, Sheila of SDI. Uh, hi, Sheila. Um, hi. Your uh, principle that you are going to talk about is collaborative action and investment. But what I think is really important also about your presence in this whole discussion and SDI's 
involvement is that I think somewhere we're all saying that even though we are the organizations that are calling for national, global, regional entities to invest more in locally driven processes, <clears throat> we're also saying that we have lots of work to do and a lot to learn to take forward locally led adaptation. So I'll hand over to you and give us a sense of how you are interpreting this and where you see the need for SDI to learn more about dealing with the challenges of deepening and advancing locally led efforts on climate action and resilience building. So, you know, when you talk about steep learning curves, I think we, everybody who's deeply committed to these principles have a steep learning curve, whichever stakeholder they are. Because we have all been trapped in a top-down hierarchy, which is also how the sequence of power operates. And a lot of the work that we do on the ground is to shake that and to transform it into a collaborative action. And I think uh, in many ways, even prior to the fact that before we all became very committed to linking uh, uh, climate to the work that we do, we have always been of the opinion that communities must not, should not, and cannot operate in isolation and that you have to move on a continuum from being ignored, invisible, marginalized in cities to being developing an identity, developing a voice, developing an agency, and more importantly, becoming participants in designing and execution of solutions that you want for yourself. Into this mix is a very important factor that we are not interested in just getting international financial assistance to replace what our state should be doing on issues of poverty. So we do want our cities to be our partners. We want the edu educational institutions and knowledge creators and technology people to be our partners. We want national governments. We want all, all these people to reformulate their roles and obligations in relationship to us, but we where the communities of the urban poor are not victims or beneficiaries or consumers of development. And so this principle of collaboration requires us to stop being perceiving ourselves as consumers of somebody else. You know, please give me money, please do this for me, please do that for me to say. We acknowledge ourselves as people who survive intergenerational poverty and survive despite the state. What can we present as solutions that we can negotiate with our municipalities, our governments, the people who have money to produce solutions that they then get embedded in the system so that we don't get this invisible non-investment treatment and have to just be surviving. So, there are a lot of things that citizens must get from their cities. There are lots of things as citizens of provincial and national governments that we should get. And we believe that international assistance, both bilateral, multilateral, and from uh, philanthropic institutions have different roles to play in this journey with us. So, how do we design that? How do we present that? How do we produce solutions? How do we scale them up? Be develop those concentric circles. And so what we feel is that this, this particular principle, uh, we believe we have the seeds of that in place already. We now have to sharpen our own articulation and our demands and aspirations and start these external negotiations. Because without negotiations, without solutions, without strategies, without demonstrating our capacities and our perspectives, we cannot become, 
we cannot just demand partnerships because we are organizations of the poor. And I think social movements are best placed to build knowledge within themselves, to negotiate it, to scale it within their networks, and then demand that they get mainstreamed into the systemic issues, be they development, be they climate, because those are now two facets of the same thing. They're not different anymore. So how do we do that? And how do we embed what works for poor people into the knowledge system? So I'll stop there. Fantastic. Lots of food for thought, which you can hopefully pick up in the breakout groups. And I'll say goodbye here. Thank you. And it's been a very thought provoking discussion so far and lots more to happen in the breakout group. So I'll hand you back to Aisha with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sanjana and and Sheila. Um, that's really thought provoking, like Sanjana said. Um, okay, we're going to move back to breakout groups now. And just like you did last time, go to the bottom of the screen and um, hit the breakout rooms button and choose the one, the principal that you would like to speak to um, and the breakout group, which has the fewest uh, folks in it. And um, again, we're going to have two breakout groups per principal. So, just choose the one that you like, and we'll be back in about 25 minutes. Thank you. I guess some of them are having really interesting discussions and don't want to leave their breakout groups. We have less than half of the people back in plenary, so just keep waiting That's for very rich discussion. Yeah, um, which is great. Um, feels like no matter how much time we have for breakouts, it's actually not long enough. Um, Okay, we're getting close to having enough folks back. So, um, everyone is back now. Great. That's awesome. um, so, we're going to do the same thing as before. Uh, we're, we're just going to do a really quick chat shower. So, if you can pull up your chat box and write down what you thought kind of the most um, thought provoking thing you heard was or, or something that stood out from the conversation. And in about 20 seconds, I'll um, do a countdown and we can do it to the tower again. All right, I'm gonna do the countdown now. Three, two, one, go. All right, um, so we have collaboration really needs long-term relationships and trust. Collaboration requires trust, risk must be shared. Um, we need to change ourselves first in order to be able to embrace these principles and then apply them. Um, a lot about trust. So that's a really key point coming out. Uh, there's an obsession with outcomes, outputs, indicators, rather than the root of the problem that we're dealing with. So this is too driven by donors and money processes. Um, all right, so some really great points coming out in the chat. Thank you, everyone. Um, before we close out, I uh, would like to invite Dr. Musa from BRAC International to give us some um, just some thoughts to wrap up. Uh, Dr. Musa, you know, if you could reflect on what you've heard today, um, what your main takeaways were, or the sort of the critical issues that you were hearing come up, and, and really where we are as a community of practice at the moment, and, and sort of what we need to move forward. Kind of Thank you very much, Aisha. Um, I, I'm really uh, pleased to be able to be here. It's been very rich and a rewarding experience to be in, in, in this conversation today. So we always talk about principles, but today we had practitioners who have been applying it uh, and uh, applying different parts of it. And what's the experience been by trying to apply those are very, very helpful to learn as we can kind of triangulate with the learning uh, we have been having in BRAC, for example, in our own, our own field. So I see a lot of commonalities, but also new learning coming out of it. So it was a rewarding experience. And I thank everybody for giving this opportunity to learn uh, and share uh, and connecting each other groups one more time that there's no, no alternative than uh, to kind of coming together, share with each other and, and uh, create our higher value through our uh, bringing our own lessons from the ground. Now, a few things that uh, came out um, 
of the uh, four principles. If, uh, you know, we are always talking from the very beginning that these principles should not be seen in isolation. They're all interlinked. Uh, they collectively form a, a, a coherent group of um, action that should allow us to advance, help advance locally led uh, um, adaptation. But uh, things that strike out of me are that there are common threads between the four we discussed today. Uh, but one uh, top level point that came out, and Selena was mentioning that, look, these principles are delicate, very delicate, and we need to really start working on ourselves first. And that's what I mentioned in that box, that we need to change ourselves first, our own mindset first, our own institution first, in order to be able to really embrace these uh, principles and adopt these principles. The four principles we discussed today are kind of uh, not not different from what we discussed yesterday, the interlink, but these quotes also have kind of elements that are in one hand saying, we want to promote uh, our flexible programming by building coalition of knowledge from both the scientific arena, but also from the communities. But on the other hand, we're also saying that, well, uh, we want to make sure that the transparency and accountability is there. Uh, so, question is that trans transparency and accountability to whom? Some of these need to be uh, resolved. But this being back to the second point, I kind of was came out across to me that are we facing some inherent tension, inherent contradiction, while trying to push these principles? Uh, and some of the tensions may be between principles, and some of them are maybe tensions within principles. A few things that came out today from the discussion, for example between principles that the whole issue of flexible programming and learning our ability to do that promote that advance that is it in contradiction with our ability to be accountable and transparent especially if we say our accountability and transparency in reality at the end of the day to eventually donors and funders unless we say actually our uh, real accountability to the people for whom we exist and that's a question. And without pointing finger, we have to also understand what our donor partners, funding partners, donors, they face. They have their own accountability too, especially in the arena like institutional donors, they have accountability to their, to their parliament. And unless we really deal with this whole systems of accountability in a way that transform itself, then possibly our ability to make it in the way that we are um, desiring, aspiring for through our principles would be difficult. So that's one type of contradiction we're talking about. Therefore, we need to work together. Here, this point came out that maybe some of our small funding partners, donors are in better position to really demonstrate how uh, flexible programming can be supported and still you can be uh, holding each other accountable and then taken to the ad, as advocacy message to the larger donors place, which could then go to the parliamentary level discussion. Some, some of us even participate in par parliamentary inquiry. We have the ability to influence some of those things too nowadays. Okay, So that's one tension. Another tension is the solution of scientific knowledge versus local knowledge. I think we are all agreeing that we can bring those together if we have the mechanisms to do that. Another interesting uh, dilemma came out in a small group I was in earlier in the flexible programming that desire of programmer team within an organization, programmers who want to be more flexible versus accountants and uh, lawyers who want to make sure that you're following rules, regulation of the organization. And therefore there's a tension there. So question is how do we really identify some of the tension points and resolve those constructively, systematically, as opposed to kind of pointing finger to each other, uh, each, each other. Uh, would not help unless we really um, uh, do this further. Here, three things came to my mind and uh, as I was learning through the sessions today. One is, we are all in a steep learning curve. Therefore, we should keep that learning process open. And learning is a journey where we basically not only take information, but also assimilate and bring, begin to bring changes at the institutional level, individual level, leadership level. Second point came out, there's no, uh, uh, no alternative to engagement engage with issues that are challenging, engage with issues that are creating tension, engage constructively and to resolve it positively, engage collectively. And here we come to the last point that Sheila did about in this whole issue of collaboration, that collaboration of all stakeholders are needed in this process because each, each stakeholder has unique value to add. And by tapping to that, 
collaborating together, we can engage in addressing some of the difficult uh, issues, challenging issues that uh, uh, that uh, obstructs us to really pursue these principles, and therefore can really get over it together. And in that process, by collaborating, we can build our trust, our longer term relationship, and that's what we should be looking for. So I'll end here that eventually that is our collective uh, willingness to really engage uh, with honesty as honest broker, broker in favor of com local communities that would allow us to really help advance this local adaptation. Thank you very much. It's been an honor to be able to come here and learn from all of you. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to working with you in the coming days too. Thank you so much, Dr. Musa. That was a truly wonderful wrap up uh, with a lot of questions, I think, for us to all keep thinking about as we move ahead on this learning journey. Um, I also just want to say a very big thank you to my co-facilitator, Mer co Merrick, especially for stepping in when my internet failed right at the beginning, um, to Saranjana for doing such wonderful panel um, interviews, to all of our panelists and all the facilitators and rapporteurs, and especially to all of you for joining the session and just very actively and honestly engaging in the conversations. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Marek to just talk about uh, a couple of next steps to keep engaged in the process very briefly, and then we'll close. Thanks again. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you, Dr. Misa, for such a wonderful wrap up. Um, just two Thank quick you. points before we close the meeting. Um, we have a Slack channel we have a Slack channel um, currently is still still dominated by several IID staff. So we have a Slack channel. The link is there. I posted it in the chat. Please do join it. We started a conversation on the principles. We've even put IID's endorsement in there. If other endorsers would like to put theirs, we can start a conversation, get feedback, start to progress them, start this learning and self-reflection that Dr. Misa so uh, clearly gave that message to us all. So do join that and we can keep the conversation. It's just for kind of keeping it um, uh, trying out if this platform is useful for keeping these conversations um, and just to say there's obviously a paper there that has some deeper information on the principles and just to say one final thing is we do have a part a community practice call with organizations interested in these principles um, if you'd like to find out more about that do email Aisha or myself and we are about to start a series of conversations on how to govern and continue this learning in the most effective way possible to shift to business unusual practice so if you'd like to engage in that do let us know but with all of that just a th huge thank you as I share thanked everyone similarly uh thank all of those who have been involved and yeah I think we can close the session <laughs>